Chapter 7 of The Hairy Ones Shall Dance by Manly Wade Wellman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Had the thing been so hairy? It did not charge at once, or I might have been killed then, like John Gird, and the writing of this account left to another hand. While it closed cautiously in, I was able to set myself for defense. I also made out some of its details, and hysterically imagined more. Its hunched back and narrow shoulders gave nothing of weakness to its appearance, suggesting rather an inhuman plentitude of bone and muscle behind. At first it was crouched as if on all fours, but then it reared, for all its legs were bent, its great length of body made it considerably taller than I. Upper limbs, I hesitate at calling them arms, sparred questingly at me. I moved a stride backward, but kept my face to the enemy. You killed Gerd, I accused it in a voice steady enough, but rather strained and shrill. Come on and kill me! I promise you a damned hard bargain of it! The creature shrank away in turn, as though it understood the words, and was momentarily daunted by them. Its head, which I could not make out, sank low before those crooked shoulders, and swayed rhythmically like the head of a snake before striking. The rush was coming, and I knew it. Come on! I dared it again. What are you waiting for? I'm not chained down like Gerd. I'll give you a devil of a fight! I had my fists up, and I fainted, boxer-wise, with a little weaving jerk of the knees. The blot of blackness started violently, ripped out a snarl from somewhere inside it, and sprang at me. I had an impression of paws flung out and a head twisted sidewise, with long teeth bared to snap at my throat. Probably it meant to clutch my shoulders with its fingers. It had them. I had felt them on my knee at the seance. But I had planned my own campaign in those tense seconds. I slid my left foot forward as the enemy lunged, and my left fist drove for the muzzle. My knuckles barked against the huge inhuman teeth, and I brought out a roundabout right, with shoulder and hip driving in back of it. The head, slanted as it was, received this right fist high on the brow. I felt the impact of solid bone, and the body floundered away to my left. I broke ground right, turned and raised my hands as before. "'Want any more of the same?' I taunted it, as I would a human antagonist after scoring. The failure of its attack had been only temporary. My blows had set it off balance, but could hardly have been decisive. I heard a coughing snort as though the thing's muzzle was bruised, and it quartered around toward me once more. Without warning and with amazing speed, it rushed. I had no time to set myself now. I did try to leap backward, but I was not quick enough. It had me, gripping the lapels of my coat and driving me down and over with its flying weight. I felt the wet ground spin under my heels, and then it came flying up against my shoulders. Instinctively, I had clutched upward at a throat with my right hand, clutched a handful of skin, loose and rankly shaggy. My left, also by instinct, flew backward to break my fall. It closed on something hard, round, and smooth. The rank odor that I'd known at the seance was falling around me like a blanket, and the clashing white teeth shoved nearer, nearer. But the rock in my left hand spelled sudden hope. Without trying to roll out from under, I smote with that rock. My clutch on the hairy throat helped me to judge accurately where the head would be. A moment later, and the struggling bulk above me went limp under the impact. Shoving it aside, I scrambled free and gained my feet once more. The monster lay motionless where I had thrust it from me. Every nerve a tingle, I stooped. My hand poised the rock for another smashing blow, but there was no sign of fight from the fallen shape. I could hear only a gusty breathing, as of something in stunned pain. "'Lie right where you are, you murdering brute,' I cautioned it, my voice ringing exultant as I realized I had won. "'If you move, I'll smash your skull in.' My right hand groped in my pocket for a match, struck it on the back of my leg. I bent still closer for a clear look at my enemy. Had the thing been so hairy? Now as I gazed it seemed only sparsely furred. The ears, too, were blunter than I thought, and the muzzle not so... Why, it was half-human.' Even as I watched, it was becoming more human still, a sprawled human figure. And as the fur seemed to vanish in patches, was it clothing I saw, as though through the rents in a bearskin overcoat? My senses churned in my own head. The fear that had ridden me all night became suddenly unreasoning. I fled as before, this time without a thought of where I was going or what I would do. The forbidden grove, lately so welcome as a refuge, swarmed with evil. I reached the edge of the clearing glanced back once. The thing I had stricken down was beginning to stir, to get up. 
I ran from it as from a devil. Somehow I had come to the stream again, or to another like it. The current moved more swiftly at this point, with a noticeable murmur. As I tried to spring across, I landed short and gasped in sudden pain, for the water was scalding hot. Of such are the waters of hell. I cannot remember my flight through that steaming swamp that might have been a corner of Satan's own park. Somewhere along the way I found a tough, fleshy stem, small enough to rend from its rooting and wield as a club. With it in my hand I paused, with a rather foolish desire to return along my line of retreat for another indecisive encounter with the shaggy being. But what if it would foresee my coming and lie in wait? I knew how swiftly it could spring, how strong was its grasp. Once at close quarters my club would be useless, and those teeth might find their objective. I cast aside the impulse that had welled from I know not what primitive core of me, and hurried on. Evergreens were before me on a sudden, and through them filtered a blast of cold air, the edge of the grove, and beyond it the snow and the open sky, perhaps a resumption of the hunt by the mob. But capture and death at their hands would be clean and welcome compared to... Feet squelched in the dampness behind me. I pivoted with a hysterical oath and swung up my club in readiness to strike. The great dark outline that had come upon me took one step closer, then paused. I sprang at it, struck and missed as it dodged to one side. All right, then. Let's have it out, I managed to blurt, though my voice was drying up in my throat. Come on. Show your face. I'm not here to fight you, a good-natured voice assured me. Why, I seldom even argue, except with proven friends. I relaxed a trifle, but did not lower my club. Who are you? "'George Keith Pursuvan,' was the level response, as though I had not just finished trying to kill him. "'You must be the young man that's so anxious to hang back in town. Is that right?' I made no answer. "'Silence makes admission,' the stranger said. "'Well, come along to my house. This grove is between it and the town, and nobody will bother us for the night, at least.'" End of chapter 7